ever stood and stared at it, marveled at its beauty, its genius? Billions of people just living out their lives, oblivious. Did you know that the first Matrix was designed to be a perfect human world where none suffered, where everyone would be happy? It was a disaster. No one would accept the program. Entire crops were lost. Some believed that we lacked the programming language to describe your perfect world, but I believe that as a species, human beings define their reality through misery and suffering. The perfect world will no dream that your primitive cerebrum kept trying to wake up from. Which is why the Matrix was redesigned to this, the peak of your civilization. And I say your civilization. Because as soon as we started thinking for you, it really became our civilization, which is, of course, what this is all about. Evolution, Morpheus. Evolution. So it's really up to you. Just have to make up your own damn mind to either accept what I'm going to tell you or reject it. Nothing about DNA has helped with the evolution theory at all. DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, is the most complex molecule in the universe. Unbelievably complicated molecule. That little DNA molecule, average person has 50 trillion cells in their body with 46 of those little molecules in each cell. 46 chromosome strands in each cell of your body. If you extracted all of it, it would only fill about two tablespoons. But if you took those DNA strands and unwound them, stretched them out, tied them together, one person's DNA would reach from Earth to the moon and back over half a million times. Round trips to the moon. It is so unbelievably complex. If you typed out the code found in your DNA, when you got done typing, you'd have enough books to fill Grand Canyon 78 times. The actual DNA replication machine that's occurring right now inside your body, at least 2002 uh, biology. So the DNA is entering the production line from the left hand side and it hits this collection, this miniature biochemical machines that are pulling apart the DNA strand and making an exact copy. So DNA comes in and hits this blue donut shaped structure and it's ripped apart into its two strands. One strand can be copied directly and it can see be seen spooling off down to the bottom there. But things aren't so simple for the other strand because it must be copied backwards. So it's thrown out repeatedly in these loops and copied one section at a time, creating two new DNA molecules. Now you have billions of this machine right now whirring the right way inside you, copying your DNA with exquisite fidelity. It's an accurate representation, and it's pretty much at the correct speed for what it's occurring inside you. But I've left out error correction and a bunch of other things. Um, this was work from a number of years ago. Thank you. This is work from a number of years ago, but what I want to show you next is updated science. It's updated technology. So again, we begin with DNA, and it's jiggling and wiggling there because of the surrounding super molecules, which I've stripped away so you can see something. DNA is about two nanometers across, which is really quite tiny. But in, a, in each one of your cells, each strand of DNA is about 30 to 40 million nanometers long. So to keep the DNA organized, to regulate access to the genetic code, it's wrapped around these purple proteins. I've labeled them purple here. It's packaged up and bundled up. All of this field of view is a single strand of DNA. This huge package of DNA is called a chromosome. And we'll come back to chromosomes in a minute. We're pulling out, we're zooming out, out through a nuclear pore, which is sort of the gateway to this compartment that holds all the DNA called the nucleus. All of this field of view is about a semester's worth of biology. Now I've got seven minutes, so we're not going to be able to do that today. No, I'm being told no. Um, this is the way a living cell looks down a light, light microscope, and it's been filmed under time lapse, which is why you can see it moving. The nuclear envelope breaks down. These sausage-shaped things are the chromosomes, and we'll focus on them. They go through this very striking motion that is focused on these little red spots. When the field cell feels it's ready to go, it rips apart the chromosome. 
One set of DNA goes to one side, the other side gets the other set of DNA, identical copies of DNA, and then the cell splits down the middle. And again, you have billions of cells undergoing this process right now inside of you. Now we're going to rewind and just focus on the chromosomes and look at its structure and describe it. So again, here we are at that equator moment. The chromosomes line up, and if we isolate just one chromosome, we're going to pull it out and have a look at its structure. So this is one of the biggest molecular structures that you have, in, at least as far as we've discovered so far, inside of us. So this is a single chromosome, and you have two strands of DNA in each chromosome. One is bundled up into one sausage, the other strand uh, is bundled up into the other sausage. These things that look like whiskers that are sticking out from either side are the dynamic scaffolding of the cell. Um, they're called microtubules, but the name's not so important. But what we're going to focus on is this red region. I've labeled it red here. And it's the interface between the dynamic scaffolding and the chromosomes. It is obviously central to the movement of the chromosomes, but we have no idea really, as to how it's achieving that movement. We've been studying this thing they call the kinetochore for over 100 years with intense study, and we're still just beginning to discover what it's all about. It is made up of about 200 different types of proteins, thousands of proteins in total. It is a signal broadcasting system. It broadcasts through chemical signals telling the rest of the cell when it's ready, when, when it feels that everything is aligned and ready to go uh, the, for the separation of the chromosomes. It is able to couple onto the growing and shrinking microtubules. It's transiently, it's, it's, it's involved with the growing of the microtubules and it's able to transiently couple onto them. It's also a tension sensing system. It's able to feel when the cell is ready, when, when the chromosome is correctly positioned. It's turning green here because it, it feels that everything is just right. And you'll see that there's one little last bit that's still remaining red and it's walked away down the microtubules. That is the signal broadcasting system sending out the stop signal and it's walked away. I mean, it's that mechanical. It's molecular clockwork. This is how you work at the molecular scale. So with a little bit of molecular eye candy, um, we've got kinesins, which are the orange ones. They're little uh, molecular courier molecules walking one way. And here are the dynein. They're carrying that broadcasting system and they've got their long legs so they can step around obstacles and so on. So again, this is all derived accurately from the science. The problem is we can't show it to you any other way. Exploring at the frontier of science, at the, at the frontier of human understanding is mind-blowing. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Darwin wrote uh, The Origin of Species in 1859, published it in 1859. He had an idea of the cell as being quite simple, correct? Yeah, everybody did. Yeah, okay. If, if he thought of the cell as being a Buick, what is the cell now in terms of its complexity by comparison? A galaxy. If Darwin thought a cell was, say, a mud hut, what do we now know that a cell is? More complicated than uh, a Saturn V. So what is in a cell uh, as far as we know now? A world that Darwin never could have imagined. I needed someone who could give me a glimpse into this world. So we went to molecular biologist Doug Axe. Think of a cell as being a nanofactory, a factory where very, on a very small scale, digital instructions are being used to make the components of the factory. Here we have the famous DNA double helix. You can see the two helical strands that are intertwined and wind around each other on the outside of the molecule. This is the material that stores all of our genetic information. In higher life forms, this will be the equivalent of something like a gigabyte of information stored in the molecules that form the individual chromosomes, all packed within the nucleus, which is a tiny fraction of the entire cell size. So what does DNA do? Well, the information in DNA ends up providing the information for sequencing the amino acids to make protein. We have information in a one-dimensional form that provides the information for a three-dimensional form. Look, see those birds? At some point, a program was written to help them. A program was written to wash over the trees and the wind and the sunrise and sunset. Their program's running all over the place. The ones doing their job, doing what they were meant to do, are invisible. You never even know they were here.
probability of one DNA happening by chance has been calculated to be one in 10 to the 119,000 power. That's a big number when you figure the entire visible universe is about 10 to the 28 inches in diameter. I'm finally just beginning to grasp the complexity of the cell. Are there systems within the cell that go well beyond Darwinian evolution? Some type of cellular technology that drives adaptation, replication, quality control, and repair? What if these new mechanisms have massive design implications? Well, I say, so be it. The cell really is like nothing we've ever seen in the physical world. That's got to be firmly grasped. That's, that's, that's not something we can just say, oh, well, it's just a little bit more of the same old, same old. It's not the same old, same old. We are finding is that there's information that's in the cell that cannot be accounted for in terms of these undirected material causes. So there's, it has to uh, be. And, and so there's, there's yeah. some, some other, so there has to be an information source. So one of the key questions faced by modern biology is, where do you get information from? Well, uh, Darwin assumed that the increase in information comes from natural selection. But natural selection reduces genetic information. And we know this from all the genetic population studies that we have. And where is the new genetic information going to come from? Well, that's the big question. So there's a big question if you're just kind of trying to assess how likely is it that we'd find a protein by chance with all the amino acids in that prebiotic soup interacting with each other for, say, billions of years. That give it a lot of time. How likely is it that we'd ever get a protein to arise by chance? So I have a colleague who's been interested in the whole question of whether or not life could arise by chance for a long time. His name is Doug Axe. He's a molecular biologist. He did his PhD at Caltech. He worked for 14 years at Cambridge University, and he wanted to find out how common or how rare are the functional sequences of amino acids among the big space of all the possible amino acids there are. And he came up with a really amazing number. And it's, it's 10 to the 74 power. So just to get the amino acid sequence properly, you've got an odds of about 1 in 10 to the 74. But there's other probabilistic hurdles that have to be overcome. If you want to build a protein, we, learn, we know from chemistry that, that you have to attach the amino acids together with what's called a peptide bond. In nature, peptide bonds occur with about a one in two, in a one in two frequency. Uh, half the bonds that form between amino acids are peptide bonds, half aren't. But if you get any bonds forming that aren't peptide bonds, you can't form a protein. So to form a protein 150 amino acids long, you've got a one in two chance at each site of getting the correct type of linkage. So you got one and two times one and two times one and two times one and two to the what power? Close to 150. Since we got linkages, we have 149, but call it 150. Okay. So another we got another huge exponential problem to overcome. So and it turns out that one in two to the 150 is equal is the same number as 10 to the 45th. One in 10 to the 45. So now we got two incredibly improbable things that we've got to overcome to build a functional protein by chance alone. One more problem. When you're building proteins, amino acids come in two flavors. There's a left-handed flavor and a right-handed flavor. They're called optical isomers, not flavors, okay? And the left-handed version is the only kind that can be used in building proteins. You get even one right-handed amino acid in there and your protein won't fold properly. So you got another probabilistic hurdle to overcome. So you've got a one in two chance at each side again, out to the 150th power. Two to the 150th power, again, is 10 to the 45. Oh my goodness. So the odds of building even a short functional protein by chance alone is 74 plus 40. You can, remember how you do this in math? You can add the exponents if you're multiplying exponential numbers. 164. Thank you very much. Okay. Wow. Now, can anyone get their mind around a number that big? There's only 10 to the 80th elementary particles in the entire universe. There's only 10 to the 16th seconds since the, the Big Bang. 
There's only 10 to the 139th total event since the, the beginning of the universe. Now, now you're starting to get the uh, understanding of why people are very skeptical that the chance hypothesis is, is going to do the job. Now, you may have heard just the opposite. Has anyone ever gotten in a discussion with you about the origin of life and said, hey, it happened by chance? I mean, do you hear that? I mean, this happens to me. I'm out and I'll be lecturing in hostile university environments and I'll, I'll get done and somebody say, well, but, but, and they want to argue with me about the probabilities. And, and I just shut the discussion down because I say, no serious scientist thinks this is the way it happened. No serious scientist thinks this is the way it happened. No serious scientist thinks this is the way it happened. No serious scientist thinks this is the way it happened. No serious scientist thinks this is the way it happened. I don't know. I... This can't be just coincidence, it can't be. What are you talking about? The Oracle. She told me this would happen. She told me that I would have to make a choice. What choice? Have you ever stood and stared at it, marveled at its beauty, its genius? <laughs>